Welcome to Spring into ETF Investing. On today's special episodes, our panel of guest speakers will be discussing satellite ETFs to strengthen your portfolio and passive management in the case for index ETFs. Welcome to Spring into ETF Investing, a special edition of ETF Market Insights. I'm Erin Allen, VP of Online Distribution with BMO ETFs. Quick reminder, today we are not providing you investment advice or recommendations. Our channel is all about providing education around investing and around ETFs focused on the Canadian do-it-yourself investor. I'm going to turn over my hosting duties to Jessica Morehouse shortly. Jessica is a personal finance expert and an accredited financial counselor. She's also the host of the popular More Money podcast, and I'm excited to have her on our channel today. So Jessica, over to you. Welcome to ETF Market Insights. I'm Jessica Morehouse. Today, we're going to be talking about how to build a portfolio using ETFs, and specifically, we're going to focus on how satellite positions can be used as a complement to strengthen your portfolio by adding greater diversification. I'm pleased to be joined by Alfred Lee, Director, Portfolio Manager, and Investment Strategist at BMO ETFs, and Andreas Rincon, Director at TD Capital Markets. His ETF team advises both institutional and wealth investors on the ETF landscape and strategies, and publishes a broad array of ETF publications, and works with TD's ETF market making team in facilitating ETF orders. And I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. Welcome. So, Alfred, I want to start with you. When we talk about portfolio construction, I think a very popular strategy that a lot of people you know, want to know more about and talk about is the core satellite approach. Did you want to kind of dive into what does that look like? What does that mean for investors? For sure. Um, a core satellite strategy originally came from the institutional side of the business. So to me, it's a really con- structured way of outperforming the market, but also controlling the fees in the portfolio. So uh, there's many different vari- variations in which you could put together a core satellite strategy, but most iterations essentially involve a low-cost index-based ETF in order to make up the core of the portfolio. And the reason why is because you can get a low-cost index ETF that tracks the TSX, for example, for six basis points, ZCN, for example. Uh, you could also get exposure to the S&P 500 for only eight basis points. So that's a good way to tie you know, majority of your portfolio to a low cost index product. The remaining portfolio, you can allocate to an active manager, uh, you can allocate to individual stocks or sector or thematic based ETFs. But when you look at it statistically, so when you look at uh, reports like SPIVA, for example, which is the S&P index versus active report, what you'll find is that active managers have had a tendency to, you know, had, had difficult time in outperforming the index over the long term. So when you look at a core satellite strategy by anchoring, let's say, 80% of your portfolio to an index, that guarantees you market-like returns for the majority of your portfolio, low-cost indexing, also diversification, but then the remaining 20%, what you could do is allocate to an active manager, or if you want to be a little bit more hands-on, you could allocate to a sector or thematic-based ETF. And we've also seen some investors that want to be really hands-on, they could pick their individual stocks and pick stocks that can potentially outperform the market. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Now, uh, Andreas, I want to go to you. Why would an investor want to consider this approach? And first and foremost, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. I think the main idea or the main goal is to have a plan. But we see a lot of advisors in, 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 in mom and pop dudes that they'll buy a bunch of different ETFs and they'll end up with a soup of uh, ETFs and a soup of different stocks within the ETFs and bonds and whatnot. If, and often what they don't really understand is what they hold. How much do they hold of technology? How much do they hold of this factor? How much do they hold of a certain stock even? They might have um, the same stock replicated across different ETFs and they might not even know it. So it's all really about having a plan. And that's where the satellite core strategy comes in. Um, as Alfred was mentioning, it originated actually from the efficient market theory. So two Americans were looking at it and saying, okay, I don't think you can beat core. I don't think you can beat index products. And, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But then, so how do you actually beat it? And one of the ways they found to beat it is, look, we can have most 
of our assets in core, low cost, efficient and whatnot, and then a little bit here and there to generate that alpha. And that's what we've seen a lot of the push there to, towards those products. If you get into the two different areas, some of the benefits, like if you look at core specifically, well, you get diversification in one single ticket, uh, which is generally very low cost, you're gonna get exposure to a variety of securities, globally, locally, and different asset classes. So it's, it's a very easy way to get exposure to the market. You also have, uh, tends to be tax efficient, tends to have a lot, a lot less turnover. So we see a lot of uh, benefits in using the, the ETF vehicle and an index product for that specifically. And most importantly, like it's a low cost. It's amongst the lowest cost products in the market and you're buying this on a big portion of your portfolio. So you're minimizing the cost um, to the broad portfolio that you have. And if you get into the satellite ones, really here's where, as Alfred mentioned, here's where you generate your alpha. You, you find satellite positions that you can tag on to your portfolio. And actually what it really does is further diversifies your portfolio because these uh, core uh, strategies might have you know, certain exposures here and there, or might not have some areas. And this is where you tag on with uh, core strategies. And sometimes they can't necessarily be that expensive and they don't move the average cost of the portfolio as much. So it's a very common way to, to invest and is one of the big benefits of that strategy. So once again, going back to the original comment is one easy way to diversify and not have a super strategy and know what you're actually investing in. Absolutely. Now, Alfred, let's talk more specifically about satellites. What makes a good satellite, uh, you know, in companion with your core portfolio? So I think it really depends on what the investor is looking for. So it could be one of three things. So usually an investor could be looking for returns above and beyond the market. So, for example, uh, a satellite portion of your portfolio, you can allocate to an active manager through an ETF or a mutual fund uh, in order to get those potential outperformance. Um, again, if you want to be a little bit more hands-on, you could allocate to you know, sectors or themes that you think are going to outperform. Very similarly, if you want to allocate to individual stocks, you can pick your own stocks for that satellite portion. I would say the other reason or another thing that a lot of investors are looking for when it comes to satellites is reducing the risk in a portfolio. So uh, that satellite portion could be allocated to sectors or themes that you know, tend to be let, less risky than the market or you know, individual stocks that tend to be more defensive as well. So things like utilities, for example, or consumer staples or infrastructure stocks, those are good examples in which you could reduce risk in a portfolio. Uh, the third purpose of uh, satellite, I would say, is uncorrelated assets. So we've seen a lot of people more interested in uncorrelated assets, especially after 2022. So as central banks were raising rates, Bonds and stocks fell together in 2022. So a lot of people have become interested in, you know, assets that are less correlated to traditional stocks and bonds in order to get proper diversification. So we've seen a lot of interest in things like gold, uh, listed infrastructure, things like listed agriculture commodities, even long short strategies. So it really depends on what the investor is looking for. So it could be additional returns above and beyond the market risk reduction, uncorrelated assets, or it could be a combination of the three. One thing that I would like to add to that is that a lot of people think of core just like pure equity only. And core can be a balanced portfolio. That's basically the core part of your portfolio. It's important to remember that, as you just mentioned, there's a lot of, been a lot of changes with the, the, the mix in, in assets and, and the willingness to have a 60-40 or whatnot. Um, but it's important to understand the core just means the, the most important part of your portfolio. Absolutely. Very important to uh, remember. Now, Andreas, I want to talk about some specific examples. Can you walk us through how sector ETFs can be used and some different sectors that might be attractive given today's market environment? For sure. I, I, I like to think about it this way. Like if you, most people, once again, think about core as, let's say, equity. So let's say you're looking at the S&P 500. Most people don't realize that when you're investing in the S&P 500, you're investing in 30% of that exposure is in either semiconductors or some technology related uh, business. So they're fairly, fairly technology heavy in, in that respect. So one way to diversify away from being technology heavy in the S&P 500 is to buy e sector ETFs on areas that are not really highly exposed in the S&P 500, let's say. So you, utilities were mentioned earlier as a great area. 
One of the areas that we see quite often is real assets, infrastructure. These are areas where we're seeing a lot of demand because it's not really well represented within broad indices that well. And these are areas that tend to have low correlation, low volatility, so very, very, very common. But you can say the exact same thing about Canada. Canada, Canada's broad index is very much bank-centric. Um, and if you invest in, the, in a core that is fairly bank-centric, you're well-to-do to buy some satellites that kind of diversify further that exposure into other areas. Let's say gold. Mm -hmm. uh, you might buy a gold ETF or you might buy something along those lines that complements what you have in Canada. So that's one of the main ways that we, we see the implementation when it comes to equity specifically. No, absolutely. So, Alfred, I know factor ETFs like dividends and value and low volatility, those all can help to tilt a portfolio. Can you discuss some examples of how this would work? Sure. So I think um, before I do so, I think it's a good idea just to highlight what factor based ETFs yes. are. Um, so, as you mentioned, um, there's factor based ETFs that target equities that have certain characteristics. So dividends, as you mentioned, is a good one. Uh, there's also low volatility, value, momentum, so on and so forth. But I think, you know, 15 years ago, when you looked at the ETF industry, it was really made up of market cap weighted ETFs, meaning that those ETFs essentially had you know, larger companies making up a higher weighting in those ETFs. I think a lot of investors realize that investing is not a one size fits all strategy. So some people may want less risk, some people may want more dividends, so on and so forth. So that's where factor based ETFs come in. But I would say, you know, when it comes to core satellite investing with factor based ETFs, they're unique in the way that they could be used for both the core or the satellite as well. So for the core position of a portfolio, for example, again, if you felt that, let's say, Canadian equity index ETF doesn't have enough dividends, you can use a dividend-based ETF as a, a, a replacement for that ETF. For the satellite position, let's say if you go back to the plain vanilla of core satellites investing, if you're using an index-based ETF for that core, you can use a low volatility ETF as that satellite to bring down the risk, for example. But we've also seen a lot of investors that you know, have a lot of technical know-how, want to be involved in their own, you know, managing their portfolio on a day-to-day -day basis. They've been using factor-based ETFs more tactically, so rotating depending on what market environment we're in. So you know, I think factor-based ETFs are unique in, in the way that they could be used for both the core and the satellite position of a portfolio. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And Andreas, I want to kind of talk to you about what are some examples of these satellites? I know there's, you know, commodities and emerging markets. Do you want to kind of speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, you know, how I like to separate them is in, in several groups, basically. So we already talked about factors. We already talked about sectors. I also look at them from an asset class perspective. I also look, in, look at them from a region perspective. And I have a little bucket called specialty. Mm -hmm. uh, so let, we already talked about factor and sector, so I'm not going to touched too much on those, but let's say the asset class ones. So most people just think about equities and think about fixed income, but also there's commodities, right? And it's very important to understand that that's another asset class and the benefits of those asset classes and the diversification uh, benefits of introducing a commodity or introducing something on those lines. Then you have what I consider a separate asset class, which are cover calls, let's say. So if you, which is, um, you know, you want a yield centric product, then why not use one of these products too? So those are, you know, you can consider those separate asset classes that you can tag along as satellites to your core. Then you have regions, uh, emerging markets, Asia specifically, Latin America, you want Europe. Um, there's many ways that you can ex get exposure to the world and it doesn't have to be part of your core, it can be part of your satellite. So you say, you think, let's say that there's a lot of growth in Asia, so you can buy an Asia-focused ETF. And that's one of the most common ways we see these days. And there's very easy ways to get cheap exposure to countries specifically. And then the last one is the specialty one is, look, there's many areas of the markets where I, you know, the, these securities or these areas will fall between the cracks, like a, the preferred share markets or a, I mentioned again, cover calls, uh, liquid alts, so alternative strategies. These are very important strategies that are generally very different to your existing core and will add value in terms of diversification, uh, differences in returns and whatnot. So it's, those are the three main areas how I split uh, or the five, I guess, if we include the factor and sector, how we split the satellite world. So you just mentioned liquid alts. Alfred, did you want to kind of expand on that for anyone who isn't super familiar? What's a liquid alt? What, what does that mean? 
Sure. So uh, liquid alt is essentially, you know, I talked about al alternatives and assets that don't typically fit into that traditional 60-40 bucket. So isn't quite equities, but isn't quite fixed income as well. So liquid alts essentially are that separate bucket. So it's alternatives, but it's also has usually daily liquidity as well. The good thing is that with a lot of the changes in the regulation, ETFs now can provide exposure to liquid alts. So things like long short strategies, uh, which I mentioned, I think in an environment like 2022, as I mentioned, when, when bonds and equities are falling together, that exposure to liquid alts is going to help you get better diversification in the portfolio. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Alfred. Thank you, Andres, for joining me. It was a pleasure. It is so great how much flexibility ETFs provide investors when it comes to portfolio construction. Being able to tilt your portfolio to certain areas where you have conviction has been made that much more accessible to DIY investors with ETFs. Well, that covers our discussion today. Thank you again both for joining me and bringing such great insights in today's session around building a portfolio of ETFs and using satellite exposures to tilt your portfolio depending on your market views. A very interesting discussion. And thanks to BMO ETFs for continuing to host these educational segments for DIY investors. I'm Jessica Morehouse. Have a great day. I'm going to turn it over to Sejal Patel shortly. Sejal is the creator and host of Strictly Money, Canada's only national personal finance program. She's a former business anchor and correspondent for CNBC and BNN and is a CFA charter holder. Sejal is also the founder of Sage Wealth Consulting and is passionate about helping women create financial independence through education. Sejal, take it away. Welcome to ETF Market Insights. I'm Sejal Patel. In this episode, we will look at the rise of index-based investing or passive investing and the important role it's playing in helping investors like you build wealth across cost-effective market access. I'm pleased to be joined by Greg Walker, Director of ETF Capital Markets with BMO. Greg has a wealth of experience in the ETF space and works closely with the capital markets teams to build new partnerships and create innovative products for investors. We also have Graham McKenzie. Graham is Managing Director of ETFs at the TMX, and Graham is also a former equity trader with more than 20 years of experience in the industry. Welcome, gentlemen. Oh, well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having us. I'm looking forward to this discussion, so let's dive in. Greg, let's kick things off. What is the difference between passive and active investing? Uh, that's a good question. So I like to think of it on a spectrum. So on one side, you have passive investing, which people in that in that end of, of the investing strategies tend to believe that it's very, very hard to beat the market, that um, it's, it's better to get exposure to the market, hold it for longer periods of time, and kind of minimize your trading to reduce costs. On the other end of the spectrum, you have active managers or, or people uh, employing active strategies, and they're kind of the opposite, if, as, you, as you might imagine. They think there are opportunities to outperform the market, that their holding periods might be a little more tactical, meaning their shorter holding periods, a little more trading, and they think they, they can carve out a little bit extra return off the, uh, off, the, off the market. In reality, most investors aren't on one or the other end. They're blending those strategies together in their portfolios. Uh, in certain areas, they might be passive. In certain areas, they might be active. Graham, index investing or ETF investing has grown exponentially over the last decade. What's behind the growth? Well, I think, as you said, it's grown exponentially over the last decade. And for example, we've seen assets under management from an ETF perspective grow from about $60 billion 10 years ago to about $350 billion here in Canada. Funds have gone from about 250 to over 1,000 ETFs. So there's obviously been that growth that's happened. Why? Well, one thing is, is people are looking for what ETFs can deliver particularly when, when we're talking about it from an index perspective or a passive perspective. And the fact that they can deliver um, the advantage of being low cost, they provide the diversification that many investors are really looking for. So that's, in a nutshell, that's really some of the biggest reasons why we've seen this, as you said, exponential growth in ETFs and passive investing. Okay. 
Greg, let's talk about the SPIVA report. And uh, SPIVA stands for S&P Indices Versus Active. These reports have been available for 20 years now. Mm -hmm. um, explain what it entails and why it could benefit investors. Yeah, they're, they're a very powerful free source of, of information. And really about, well, I think it was 2002, they first started uh, this, this body of research and it was S&P Global that um, decided to, to go down this path. And it came from uh, a need or, or at least an identified need where investors were trying to figure out when to go active, when to go passive, when to use indexes, when to you know, hire an active manager. And, but it, it's hard to do. You, you, there's a lot of research there and it's hard to know where to pick the, your spots. Um, so they created this body of research that is both by region and asset class that compares apples to apples active managers' uh, performance over, I think it's one, three, five, and maybe even 10 at this point, year, year holding periods, versus if you had used the index itself. And they just go through uh, systematically and, and unbiased uh, in their approach uh, when, when, what it looks like in certain regimes uh, for the active managers. So it's a very, very, very powerful uh, body of research. Graham, based on the latest SPIVA report, and let's look at the Canadian funds, and the most recent performance results. What is the research telling you about active versus passive performance? Well, you know, the last SPIVA report that looks at 2022 is really kind of interesting. And, and what happened in the marketplace also really explains it. If you look back at the end of 2021 and the start of 2022, the largest company in the S&P TSX composite in the S&P TSX 60 was Shopify. Shopify was down 73% in 2022. And if it, you're an active manager and you're underweight, you're gonna outperform. So what does that mean from a, you know, a data perspective or in the SPIVA report? Only 37% of active managers beat, that are focused on Canadian equities beat the benchmark. So it really tells you what, what's happening out there from an active perspective when you have potentially something that could really drive your performance to that degree. When you go back even further and take a look at how the performance was for Canadian focused um, funds, um, when you look at three years back, it was only 29% beat the benchmark. You go back five years, it's 8%. And then you even go back 10 years, as Greg was alluding, these reports can look that far back, 10 years, only 4% of active fund managers beat the benchmarks. So that's Canada. Uh, Greg, I'll ask you this question. Are there geographic regions where active management is beating passive management? There are, there, there definitely are. So, and, and I think that again, the reports do a very nice job. The one area that kind of stuck out to me for 2022 was global active equity uh, managers. Um, so similar stats in a sense that in 2022, 46% of the managers for that year beat the indexes. You know, that doesn't seem like a lot. That's less than 50%. Sure, if you had one of those active managers, you're, you're, you're pretty happy that you, you have them. Um, but what's interesting about that time period is actually if you, if you go out that three years that Graham mentioned, the, uh, the, the amount of uh, active managers that bought, uh, beat the index were, was only 7%. Put another way, 93% of the managers did not beat the index. So it's an interesting thing because it's not just looking at regions, but also time frames, right? So while it's 46 doesn't sound like a lot for active managers to beat the index, it's actually multiple times the, the runway, three, five years kind of thing. And there was a sim similar reasons. They were, they, there was a lot of stress in the market. There was uh, inflation shocks. There was geopolitical uh, things starting to, to pop up. And there was an opportunity to um, kind of look at that part of the portfolio and maybe apply some active uh, management to it. Um, looking out further periods, it, it reverts back, you know, three, five, 10 years, it reverts back to very hard to outperform the index. So what I say is it's, 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 there are opportunities to blend active and passive. The tough part of it is how do you know where you are in time? Are you about to enter an area where an active manager can outperform a global active equity? Or are you behind that time? So I think that's where we see a lot of flows go into index and passive because you can hold it over longer periods of time. 
You don't necessarily have to time when these events happen, but there is room for active. If you're very, very good at timing it, then there are opportunities out there in certain regions to, to outperform. It's just knowing where, what point in time you're, you're at. Graham, of the active managers that do manage to outperform, how many actually do it consistently? Because I think this is what investors, a lot of investors want to know. You know, that's a really good question. And you know what, S&P does actually dig a little further further into the data and they, they actually publish a report called uh, the Persistent Report as part of uh, the SPIVA reports. Um, the one for 2022 will come out probably sometime later this spring, but if we look back, because we can look back and see how the data looks. And so if we look back at the last report and you look at the fund managers that were in the top quartile of performance, though not one single one of them two years later was in the top quartile. So if you're in, one, in the top quartile one year and you stretch it back two years, they didn't actually find any of those same fund managers in that same top quartile, two years out. Greg Spiva focuses on equities, but there really isn't an equivalent for the fixed income space. So can you shed some light when it comes to active versus passive in the bond market or fixed income market? In other words, when does it make sense for an investor to use active managers? Uh, it's a very good question. Actually, not in Canada, but in the US and UK, Spiva does have a fixed income report. And I only mention that because it can be used as a proxy a little bit for, for Canadian uh, investors to try to get a sense of, of where, to do, uh, where to apply active and where to apply index investing. Um, that said, we don't have that in Canada. So it is, it's an interesting question because it really comes down to what are the investors' needs. And a lot of investors look at their fixed income part of their portfolio as almost like one allocation, right? If you're looking at a pie chart, it'd be a solid wedge. Here's my fixed income allocation. But because ETFs have been around, fixed income ETFs have been around for over 20 years now, you really do have the ability to be as thoughtful and as surgical in your fixed income part of your portfolio as you are in your equity, equity part of your portfolio. So as a, as a general example, I mean, you, you could come in and get a very clean, efficient, um, diversified allocation to broad uh, Canadian fixed income. You, you get Canadian firms diversified across regions, you'd get government and you'd have diversification across maturity dates and, and uh, coupons. That's, that's totally fine. If, if an investor wants to look at that part of the portfolio and say, actually in my fixed income part, I want to drive a little bit more uh, return or I want to um, have a higher yield there, you can start to carve it up a little bit and say, well, maybe in credit, I know a good credit manager, I'm going to apply uh, that manager to that, you know, the credit sleeve of my fixed income portfolio. Maybe I want exposure to discount bonds, right? So I can buy an index wedge of the portfolio and get exposure to discount bonds in the portfolio. So you get the sense that you can actually, you can actually be quite thoughtful about your fixed income side of it because of the, the tool of an ETF. It sounds like there's a role for both. So Graham, let me ask you, how can investors combine both active and passive investing? How, how would that work? Well, one of the most common, uh, maybe not the most common, but one of the tactics or maybe one of the approaches that many advisors use and, and investors use is this uh, approach called the core and satellite. And so what that is, is you build your core of your portfolio, the bulk of your portfolio, utilizing low cost, broad uh, market indice products and ETFs to build you know, that core, as I said. And then you start to utilize satellite investments to either manage risk through diversification or take a tactical approach and add potentially um, different satellites that would provide you with an opportunity to outperform the market. And that's where the active uh, component comes in. Because if you take, um, take a look at what, what a passive fund is, or an index fund is, it's trying to return or give you the return of the market or the benchmark. Where an active portfolio manager is really going out and trying to beat the market. So utilizing the satellite where you uh, either using a few different funds to enhance your performance 
with an active manager, just the same way as you might do that uh, in ways of looking to add income or risk management tools of diversification. So that's that's probably you know, one of the common approaches that's utilized where you combine both passive index managed products with active. Greg, at BMO, what are the main index ETFs that cover the broad market indexes? It's an excellent question, and, it, and it, sometimes it gets harder to, to figure out what ETFs to use because there are so many out there now. A very powerful resource is BMOETFs.com. You can go there, you can sort through you know, the many, many ETFs, and you can really drill down into fixed income or drill down into equity. But on the, uh, off the top of it, some very, very useful and, and some of our biggest fund uh, ETFs are ZCN, which is broad exposure to Canadian equity, um, ZEA, which is broad exposure to international equity, ZSP, which is actually, if not the biggest, one of the biggest ETFs in Canada, uh, which is based off and tracking the S&P 500. And on the fixed income side of things, ZAG is the Canadian broad exposure that we talked a little bit about in terms of a, a very broad index uh, exposure to, to Canadian fixed income. And then there's ZUAG, which is the US version of that. So a diversified portfolio of, of US corporates and governments. And remind me, uh, just because two ETFs cover the same market index doesn't mean that they're created equal, right? No, it's it's absolutely true. And, and as there's more and more uh, funds out there. Uh, it is important to take a look. Uh, just because they have index in the name uh, doesn't mean they're exactly the same. Um, the nice thing about ETFs in general is that they are highly transparent. So you can, and I would suggest you would, like if you're looking at two exposures from two different providers, take a look at their history, take a look at their uh, reputation in the space, and then take a look under the hood of the fund because the information's on, on most providers' uh, website. They, they give you the whole look through into what the fund's holding and what it's tracking. For investors who are looking for international exposure, when they're looking at international ETFs, why is it important that the ETF actually has direct holding of the securities? It's, uh, and it's a good reason to look under the hood. It doesn't take a lot of time. You, you can go to a website and check, but if an ETF is not holding the underlying and it's an international, Simply put, you might be double taxed. Uh, double withholding tax is what's happening there. So if you if you wrap a, a U.S. listed uh, ETF that then holds underlying international, you're paying the U.S. fund pays withholding tax, and then you're buying and the the distribution you get from the U.S. to Canada, you pay it again. So what do you do about that? Just simply look at the holdings, and if the holdings are owning directly the international, you are paying withholding tax, but it's only once, and that's that would happen even if you held it outside an ETF. If you, if you hold international securities, there's one level. If it's wrapping, you might be paying tax twice for, for no real value. And would it actually say that? It'll say it in the sense that if you look underneath, it'll, it'll hold the, show the holdings, and then you can just tell. It'll, if it's holding another ETF, it'll show that it's holding another ETF. Graeme, one of the biggest challenges I hear from investors is they don't know how to create an actual portfolio using ETFs. And we know that asset allocation is one of the most important determinants when it comes to success, performance success, and meeting someone's goals. Good news is there are things called asset allocation ETFs. So can you explain what those are and how they work? Yeah, for sure. The, you're, you're absolutely right. The, this is something that really helps a lot of investors. And these are your all-in-one solutions uh, sometimes they're referred to as portfolio ETFs. Sometimes they might be referred to as balance funds and such. And what these are is, as I said, there's all-in-one solutions where you essentially get an asset allocation based on either your risk tolerances, your stage of, of, of your life. Um, and what they are is a professionally managed ETF in the sense that the asset allocation is taking care of you for you as well as the rebalancing. You get the advantage of broad-based index funds coupled across or essentially laid out across different asset classes. And one of the challenges that, that I think you've not only figuring out what the asset allocation is, but one of the challenges that comes is how often do you rebalance and return your portfolio to your target um, allocation or the optimal sort of portfolio allocation? 
And what these funds can really do for you at a low cost is provide you that rebalancing so that it will stay on target for what the outcome or the risk performance that you're looking for. Greg, Graham, thank you for your insights today. Thank you. Thank you. Index-based ETFs offer tremendous value to investors, which is clear from our discussion today. These are low-cost, well-diversified, and the SPIVA data is definitely insightful in terms of performance benefits as well. I also enjoy the discussion around how investors can look to combine both active and passive by adopting a core satellite approach to their investments. Now that covers off our session. I want to thank BMO ETFs for continuing to host these educational segments for do-it-yourself investors and helping them become more informed. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.